Hello, my name is Steve Patti. I'm a vice president, Longquist Sequestration here in Austin, Texas. I'm happy to be presenting at Carbon Expo 2022. I've been asked to speak to you about the history of carbon capture and sequestration and possible future outlook from what we're seeing in the industry today. I'm gonna to try to follow this outline covering these key topics. I'll begin by giving a little background into Longquist sequestration and why we're here talking to you today. I'll then cover underground injection control and talk to you about where these regulations are stemming from. Why are we being regulated in such a fashion? We'll then discuss state primacy process and which states are trying to achieve primacy to govern class six regulations. We'll talk about the incentives, the tax incentives that have driven the industry to its in peak interest today. And then we'll finish by looking at some future outlook uh, topics, some subject matters on both challenges and possible growth in the industry. Longquist sequestration, how did we come about? Our parent company, Longquist and Company, uh, is a petroleum engineering and energy consulting firm uh, with several offices in the United States and Canada. We currently employ approximately 85 geologists, geoscientists, petroleum engineers, and field personnel. We have several locations in the States and in Canada with our headquarters being in Austin, Texas, and primary office in Houston driving our field work. Um, our main office in Canada is headquartered in Calgary. We serve as more than 300 clients currently in a wide variety of uh, interests. The primary book of work that we find ourselves involved with is in underground injection. Projects from class one uh, hazardous, non-hazardous industrial waste wells through class two, three, all the way including class six carbon sequestration wells. We work very closely with the salt cavern industry, both in solution mining of salt caverns and in the storage of hydrocarbons and energy storage efforts in salt caverns. Two years ago, when interest began ramping up for carbon sequestration projects, Longquist and company formed Longquist Sequestration to handle that book of work. This group within our company focuses on all the key aspects of a carbon sequestration project from strategic support of obtaining IRS 45Q tax credits through greenfield selection, all the way to um, the end of life for one of these wells. Our suite of services can be complete from cradle to grave, or we can, we, we're happy to work with clients in just areas that they need some expertise in. When we started along with sequestration, we began with working with the uh, state of Louisiana in their push to petition for primacy over class six regulations. Projects began coming in, interest in projects in the state. We began discussions with the injection mining division of the Department of Natural Resources in Louisiana. They expressed an interest in petitioning for primacy. We were one of several consulting groups that helped review their draft regulations. We helped push those draft regulations through legislative process in the state of Louisiana, which would grant Department of Natural Resources Injection and Mining Division from the state level with the authority to petition the EPA. Um, once the formal petition was submitted to the EPA, several members of Longquist and Company, Longquist Sequestration, currently sit on 
the ad hoc committee in the state of Louisiana going over potential roadblocks, potential complications, potential questions that may arise once the regulations are promulgated and released. Um, overall, we have had more than 75 inquiries into carbon sequestration projects, and we've been holding presentations of this nature at least once a week for the past 18 months to two years. Currently, Longquist Sequestration has filed one complete UIC Class 6 application with EPA Region 6, and ongoing projects we're currently working on five Class 6 applications, 20 greenfield geologic investigation, strategic planning, and greenfield site selection projects. And we're currently permitting five class two acid gas injection wells, plus MRV applications in several states. The class two MRV applications is another way of potentially qualifying for 45Q tax credits. This map shows you many of the regions, areas, states that we've been involved with, at least at an introduction, initial greenfield evaluation for possible site selection for a project. Uh, clearly, the Gulf Coast region from Brownsville through Florida is where we're seeing the most projects. That region of the United States is generating the most greenhouse gases and possesses um, the, some very favorable depositional environment to inject carbon dioxide. Underground injection control. Where did this all start? A little bit of history and background into the subject. The Safe Drinking Water Act of 1974 was passed and it authorized the EPA to regulate all injection wells into the earth. In 1977, the EPA designated or defined five classes of injection wells. Classes one through five, we'll go into greater detail on the next slide, but these were the initial definitions that all well permits, all well designs and, and operational considerations were based off of. In 2010, the EPA added in a class six, and this was reserved for carbon sequestration wells. You will see on here that two of the classifications do qualify for 45Q tax credits, and that's the class six wells and class two acid gas injection and or enhanced oil recovery wells. Classifications, the initial classifications of wells, classes one through five. Class one was uh, identified wells as industrial waste. They can be hazardous or non-hazardous waste. These can be anything from agricultural discharge from, uh, from crop and, and animal livestock uh, runoff to landfill runoff to industrial waste from petrochem and chemical plants um, that have a hazardous or non-hazardous affluent stream coming from their process. These wells typically inject into deeper formations that have upper and lower confining limits containing the fluids being injected. Class two wells were reserved for the hydrocarbon exploration and development industry. <clears throat> So these would be for injection wells, these are gonna be your saltwater disposal wells, your enhanced oil recovery wells, your hydrocarbon storage wells, whether they be in caverns or depleted reservoirs for gas storage. Class three wells were your solution mining wells. These are wells primarily fresh water would be injected into a formation and the minerals would be dissolved and recovered back at the surface through extraction of the fluid displaced from the well. These would be salt, uh, salt wells, uh, potash mining, sulfur mining wells. These, these would all be examples of class three wells. Class four 
Class four, we haven't seen very much activity in recent years, but class four was injection into shallow freshwater aquifers, but of a hazardous nature. Many of our radioactive isotopes and elements that we extracted for nuclear programs <coughs> came from resources found in freshwater aquifers. And so wells were created to inject fluids into these aquifers and displace radioactive isotopes from the formations. And then class five was the all other wells. So this is your monitor wells. This is your non-hazardous shallow injection wells. <clears throat> um, many, many wells that didn't fit class one through four, they all went into here. This includes the original carbon sequestration or carbon disposal, carbon injection wells of the early 2000s. All wells up until the definition in 2010 of a class six well were classified and permitted as a class five carbon injection well. Class six established the carbon sequestration well. This is the permanent sequestration, the permanent injection and disposal of carbon dioxide into a confined interval. Um, the class six regulations <coughs> borrowed, uh, merged many of the rules and regulations from other classes, one through five, into the development of the class six regulations. Uh, many of the aspects of class one wells, some aspects of class two, they're all incorporated into the development of class six. These rules include extensive site characterization. It's required for a class six carbon sequestration well. The area of review for one of these injection wells is determined, it is defined by the area of influence of the plume of the material being injected. The carbon dioxide will develop a plume within the reservoir and the extents of that plume define the area of review for one of these projects. <clears throat> You're required to conduct metallurgical analyses on appropriate construction materials for one of these wells corrosion resistant alloys and cements are recommended to be considered. And in cases that we have seen so far um, are, are required to, to be constructed using these materials. Um, co a comprehensive monitoring program must be developed and maintained throughout the life of the well. And finally, financial liability has to be maintained through the, through the life of the entire project. The life of the project would be defined as the duration it takes for the, the carbon dioxide in the formation to cease movement and to become locked in place. At that time, the government, whichever agency has primacy over your jurisdiction, would be able to assess when that project can be released from responsibility. This slide, uh, presents a, a cartoon of the different classes of wells, giving a conceptual idea of where these wells are typically developed, typically generated. It's just a different way of describing what I just discussed. State primacy. So the class six regulations currently, as with all EPA, uh, UIC rules are overseen by the United States Environmental Protection Agency. States can petition the US EPA to be granted primacy to govern those rules and regulations in the EPA stead on behalf of the EPA. And so the next section is going to discuss some of the primacy efforts and where we stand currently today. This is a map which shows the various regions. There are 10 US EPA regions and each region governs a group of states. Um, most of our efforts today at Longquist sequestration are uh, focused in region six and region four. 
This map shows which states have primacy over which US EPA UIC regulations. Most of the United States has primacy over classes one through five. Some states have only primacy over class two wells. There are only two states currently that have primacy granted to them to regulate class six wells. The first two wells to gain primacy were North Dakota and Wyoming. Louisiana is very close to achieving primacy, being granted primacy. We anticipate within the next three months, at most six months, uh, Louisiana should have primacy. Texas is not far behind them. They, they have begun uh, the primacy request uh, phase. And end of this year, sometime next year, they should have primacy. The petition process for primacy for a state takes approximately two years. It's divided into four key phases. Uh, in, in the initial phase, the state just reaches out to the EPA region, which oversees their, their state, and begins discussions and express an interest in petitioning for, for primacy. What are the potentials? What do we need to do? What does it mean for us? <clears throat> Excuse me. In phase two, the the states issue authority to given branches of their government to oversee primacy if it's if it is uh, mandated if it is directed to that state. Um, in this phase, draft regulations are put together, and these draft regulations are sent off to the EPA for comment, for review, for modification. Um, it's, it's here where the, the, the specific entities, specific agencies will be um, outlined or defined. So for Louisiana, for example, the Louisiana Department of Natural Resources Injection and Mining Division has been granted authority to regulate on Louisiana's behalf once primacy is granted. Texas Railroad Commission in Texas has, has been issued authority by the state once primacy is issued. And so this is, the, this is the phase of the project. In phase three, the actual petition, the application is being evaluated. A detailed look into your regulations. Um, during this period, once significant comments have been issued and changes or alterations made, this point, public notice, public hearings will be held um, and public comments will be received and addressed. The EPA will then re-review the application. They will re-review the changes and the responses to public comment. And in phase four, a final ruling will be made and the EPA will issue author authority to the petitioning state, granting them permission to uh, promulgate and regulate class six or whatever uh, EPA classification wells they are applying for on their behalf. All right, some of the tax incentives. What, what has been the key driver to a significant substantial uptick in interest in carbon sequestration? It's primarily the tax incentives. In 2008, the government allowed for tax credits to be offered to entities injecting carbon into the earth. <clears throat> the initial tax credits were low and the qualifications were very stringent. So there's very little interest, there's very little um, uh, seeking of this performing of carbon sequestration at that time. $20 a metric ton for disposal and $10 per metric ton of for enhanced oil recovery. You're to qualify, you had to generate or capture a minimum of 500,000 metric tons per year. 
only power generation facilities qualified. Only the emitters or those capturing the carbons qualified. So you had to be a power company generating over 500,000 metric tons and capturing your own gas to qualify. Nobody else qualified. <clears throat> the cap was set at 75 million metric tons for the life of the tax credit. In 2018, these tax credits evolved. They were improved upon and from this, the IRS 45Q tax credits were issued. And when they were released, interest in carbon sequestration peaked. It began to grow tremendous. Uh, the, the, the Bipartisan Act of 2018, it will affect all carbon capture facilities, not just power plants. And it, it, it applies to all facilities built after February 9th, 2018. So any carbon capture and injection facility after February 9th, 2018 qualify for this, this tax credit. Um, it does not, pro, it does not um, limit the qualifications to just power companies. It increased the tax credit from $20 for sequestration to $50 and <laughs> increased injection for enhanced oil recovery from $10 to 35. So these numbers started to have impact, started to have meaning on those capturing carbons at carbon dioxide at their smokestack. Um, the cap was removed on new projects, but you will see 45Q did establish a twilight or expiration of the tax credits. The 500,000 metric ton minimum was lowered to 100,000 and all industrial facilities could qualify. The 500,000 metric tons still applies to power companies, power plant generation companies. The new Bipartisan Budget Act also allows for direct air capture facilities, removing CO2 from the air to qualify for this tax credit. In 2019-2020 uh, range, 45Q was released by the IRS. They developed the actual tax credits from the Bipartisan Act of 2018. They identified the qualifiers. They identified the terms of the tax credits. Currently, construction on a carbon sequestration project in order to qualify has to commence before January 1st of 2026. <clears throat> this means that the facility construction must begin before this date. Okay, construction is considered begun once the physical work, a significant portion of the, significant of the physical work has, be, has started, get commenced, or 5% of the planned budget for the project has been spent. This is the qualifier for beginning before January 1st, 2026. The credits expire after 12 years of the initial injection. So once you begin injecting, into the well, you get tax credits. Those credits are good for 12 years. <coughs> um, the tax credits, they did qualify that you could not be receiving your carbon dioxide from naturally productive geologic reservoirs and pumping it in to get, pumping into a sequestration well to get tax credits. They do not qualify. Um, and the tax code allows for partnerships, for sharing of credits, for, um, for leveraging tax credits in a commercial standpoint. So it opened a door to not only the emitter and the source of the capture, but it, it allows for partnerships to be formed to share these tax credits. 
These two tables outline in the current tax code, the ramping up of the tax credit from $20 for geologic disposal up to $50, taking it from 2017 up to 2026. And similarly for enhanced oil recovery use from the $10 up to $35. So if you started injecting today and qualified, you would be getting 37.85 a ton and it ramps up. And after 2026, it will be adjusted annually per inflation. Future outlook. What are we seeing? Where do we think this is all going to go? Currently, there are several states applying for primacy. As we discussed, Louisiana is about to get it. Texas has, has petitioned and should be getting it within estimating about a year. There are other states that are also going through the process. This is the most um, active flow chart of who's applying currently. This map shows which states have at least expressed interest in primacy over class six regulations. So you see Louisiana, Texas, Arizona, uh, West Virginia are further along in the primacy process. But there are four other states, you know, Arizona, Nebraska, Montana, Kansas. They've at least made inquiries to the EPA um, about inquiring about class six primacy. The, there are some proposed changes to the 45Q tax credit being debated in Congress at the time of this presentation. <clears throat> they have not been approved. We do anticipate that there's a strong chance, depending on which bill they're attached to, they will get approved. From what we have been told anecdotally in conversations, there's bipartisan support for these changes. Um, the biggest change is an option for direct pay. And actually direct pay may have the most opposition, but it, 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 it appears to be discussed uh, favorably overall. Um, this allows for a direct pay option instead of just a tax credit issue. However, they have assessed significant reductions to that direct pay option depending on time scale. So, you know, as outlined in this table, you can see anything constructed, if the construction commenced before 2025, you can get 100% of tax credit direct pay. After 2025, it drops to 95 to 85. And then 20 set, if, if you begin construction 2027 or later, you no longer qualify for the direct pay. The tax credits have been increased. They're being proposed to be increased. Tax credits, the proposed increase is from $50 to 85 for geologic sequestration and from 35 to $60 for enhanced oil recovery operations. They do come with some qualifiers, however. You must meet, the project must meet prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements in order to qualify for those full values. If they do not, the tax credits are greatly reduced. Um, direct air capture has been allowed a much higher tax credit should these changes be approved. The proposed change to direct air capture is on $180 per metric ton. Direct air capture has the highest cost per metric ton captured of all of the capture methods. And so it's commanding a higher tax credit allowed. Um, again, you must meet the same prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements in order to qualify for full credit. Another important change being proposed is that the tax credits 
will extend to 2031 for the startup of the project. So currently, you have to begin construction before January 1st, 2026. This is extending to January 1st, 2031. We, we believe that this, that this uh, change is, is being considered because the, the legislators involved are understanding the, the regulatory complexities of the, the creation of an application, the review of an application, the lead time on the line to pick up an application for review. All of these are gonna complicate and extend the timeline considerably. And 2026 is a hard deadline to meet. And so they've extended it to 2031. Some challenges. <coughs> We're, Currently, the majority of the projects being looked at being considered from a greenfield and strategic uh, evaluation, they're focusing on undisturbed tracts of land, minimal artificial penetrations or, or well construction, and favorable geologic conditions. As these projects begin to develop, the amount of the, of the undisturbed acreage that will be available will decrease con continuously. And so finding the appropriate place, the best location for one of these projects is going to become harder and harder as, as time goes on and as more and more people get involved in the, in the industry. Um, the timeline to review the, the class six applications uh, right now, currently, it is anticipated, depending on which jurisdiction you find yourself being regulated by, anywhere from 12 months to two years to review an application. This is without consideration for any type of queue that you would find your application in to be picked up to be reviewed by the regulatory agency. And so the applications are complicated. The applications require significant detail to be included. And the more detail you include extends the, the review time by the regulators. And we see this as a challenge in getting a project to the point where an authority to inject is issued and you can begin actually disposing of carbon dioxide into one of these wells. This is going to be further complicated by more and more projects being proposed, being permitted, applications being submitted for review. More and more applications are gonna start getting turned over to these agencies. That line to be picked up is going to grow and is going to extend the timeline. We, we see this as a significant challenge to the sequestration industry. And um, there are, there are um, several proposals out there to mitigate or to overcome some of these challenges, especially the challenge on, on the queue with uh, third-party uh, peer review, third-party review of applications on behalf of agencies, um, farming out the review of the permits as, as an option to the applicant, um, but the line we predict is going to be long and the review process is going to take a long time. The outlook, the outlook overall is, is very favorable. If all of the proposed 45Q tax changes are approved, <coughs> the interest in a carbon sequestration project is only going to grow. Uh, we, we anticipate it could grow more than a, a 2x, 4x multiplier, it may be exponential. Um, th and then this is, this is positive for the industry. Um, what happens when the tax credits expire? So there's a lot of talk of when the tax credits expire, your 12 years is up, 
are these projects just going to people going to just shut them in and and give up? The reality is, we we anticipate or we believe that that the twelve years was uh, put into the rules to allow industry a decade to catch up or to to expand upon to improve upon capture technologies emission uh, needs so the the process of generating electricity the process of of the chemical or or petrochemical or industrial process uh, activity the efficiencies will improve to where less emissions are generated less emissions have to be captured the capture technology will improve less carbon dioxide will be generated captured the captured di carbon dioxide will be cheaper to capture etc all these things will happen over the next decade um, and so this buys industry as a whole in the united states time to really look into advances in technology we feel that with these advances of tech in technology, there will be less need for sequestration, but we feel that the social responsibility avenue of all of these companies will drive the continued desire and need for carbon sequestration. And so uh, the, 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 the need for carbon sequestration is not going to disappear. It's not gonna go away the interest in the industry is not going to fade away. It's going to stay with us for the foreseeable future. Furthermore, it's theorized that financial investment, that seeking of loans to maintain facilities, to expand facilities, to repair facilities, will be highly predicated on how robust their carbon management program is. A facility that has a very small carbon management attempt or effort may only be able to borrow loans at a much higher rate or investment firms may no longer invest in that company. So in order to get low interest rates, in order to attract investment groups to maintain facilities, to grow facilities, to improve facilities, they're going to have to demonstrate a robust carbon management program to attract that attention. And so from a social aspect, from an economic aspect, we, we, see, we see the need for carbon sequestration in the future to, to continue on. And then there's the international expansion. Once the United States, Europe has several projects, Australia has several projects. Once the technology, once the, the process, the operations of these wells, once all that has been proven over and over again, we will see expansion into other countries, countries that may not have, uh, may not have the same regulations that the United States or Canada have. Um, but they're going to be interested in it nevertheless. And so they'll probably look to us here in the United States, North America, Canada. They'll look to us as examples on how to succeed in these efforts. And so we see a strong potential for international expansion of, of these carbon sequestration efforts. And that concludes my presentation. I look forward to receiving questions and speaking with anyone interested at the conference. Thank you for your time.